Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome our speaker today, a uh, friend and colleague of many of us uh, in the department, uh, Professor Greg Durgan from Georgia Tech. Uh, Georgia, uh, Greg has been at uh, Georgia Tech since 2003 and is currently uh, serving as a professor. He received the bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees from uh, Virginia Tech and has received several uh, best paper awards in, uh, from IEEE Transactions on Communications, IEEE Microwave um, Magazine, and a few others. Um, he's the winner of the NSF Career Award, as well as uh, numerous uh, teaching awards at Georgia Tech. And he's a consultant to industry in all kinds of exciting um, areas. Um, Greg is also a distinguished lecturer for the IEEE uh, Committee on RFID. So thank you very much, Greg. Pleasure to have you here. Oh, Thanks for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me and for hosting me. Um, I love visiting uh, the Seattle area and University of Washington in particular. In fact, I think I gave a guest lecture here back in 2010. Um, it was a while ago. <clears throat> so I had to go back and make sure the slides were different, right? Be a, be a good faculty and update your material. So I think they're all different this time. Um, and this is actually a version, a highly customized version of the, the distinguished lecture talk that I give for IEEE as a lot of new and different material that only people in U University of Washington will hear. So uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I've been looking forward to this. I thank you, Matt, for inviting me, inviting me and playing logistics and organizing all my uh, visits with uh, all my faculty friends here at uh, uh, University of Washington. So, Today, the, the, the loose title of the talk is Wireless Forever, the Future of RF Systems That Never Plug In. Um, and this is stuff that we've been working on for a while at Georgia Tech. In fact, when I first got to Georgia Tech, um, I was just sort of a conventional wireless guy. I'd grown up in a research program that did mostly cellular communications because they were still building out the 2G network all the stuff about 5G. There was a 2G at one point, and uh, I was a sort of a conventional radio and electromagnetics guy. And at new faculty orientation, there was this uh, other professor that Georgia Tech had lured from the University of Arizona. His name was Bernard Kippelin, a good printable electronics guy. He approached at, uh, me at University of uh, uh, at new professor orientation. And he said, ah, Greg, uh, do you know anything about RFID? We would like to, our center would like to get into that area. And we need a collaborator that knows something about RFID. And so I did what any good assistant professor did. I lied through my teeth. I said, yeah, sure, I know what that is. And then I went home and read all the papers. And I went, oh, this is different than I was thinking. And that's how I got into the field of energy harvesting and low-powered communications. And so I always owe my good friend Bernard Kippelin a, a debt of gratitude for dragging us into that field. Now, <clears throat> I do a lot of work with the IEEE CRFID. They promote my distinguished lecture series. And I do a lot of, of work with the conferences there. If you're thinking about submitting, we have uh, a 2019 conference in Phoenix uh, next year. And the international version is going to be later this year in Macau. We just came out with a launched journal on RFID from the IEEE, and we've had this virtual journal around for a while. So be looking for those publications. Please submit if you're working in those areas. It's a really neat technical community. It's one of the, the true multidisciplinary uh, communities in the IEEE where everybody kind of gets what each other is doing, but at the same time, you're working with very different people, people that know chips, people that know electronics, that know how to program, that know antennas and propagation. And so it's a, a really fun place to be. Now, for myself, uh, I've been at Georgia Tech since my end of my 15th year. I blinked, and it was 15 years. And uh, I did my PhD at the end of 2000 at Virginia Tech. Uh, I graduated from their mobile and portable radio research group. Uh, I did a postdoc over at the University of Osaka, because I figured, hey, why not? And then uh, after that, I, I took this uh, assistant professor gig at uh, Georgia Tech, and uh, 15 years later, I've really enjoyed my time. I love teaching students. And uh, my research program, I, we, we get into a lot of different things. You know, as an electromagnetics professor, I teach all those courses that you undergrads probably hate, you know, like EMAG 101 and that sort of thing. Um, I see them like, oh, yeah, I know that class. Uh, 
I, uh, my research kind of falls into applied electromagnetics and RF. I do some backscatter radio, some low power radio, wireless power transfer, radio location. We've done a, quite a bit of work in that area. And then a wireless channel model was sort of our bread and butter from the beginning. Uh, I direct a, uh, the Opportunity Research Scholars Program back at Georgia Tech CCE. That's where we take 80 ECE students every year embed them in teams in live laboratories, and we get them to conduct research projects alongside PhD mentors. It's an awesome program because the PhD mentors get to figure out like, hey, is this an academic advising thing for me? Is it, can I do something like this when I get out of here? And we found that the students uh, are less likely to uh, switch majors or they, they just get more involved and form a really neat community uh, among themselves, uh, and we always see like GPAs rise when that happens. So it's open to everybody, uh, and it's got all these industry sponsors who uh, really, really love working with the students as well. So that takes out a, up a good portion of my time in addition to the teaching and research. I also have my own YouTube channel that I put undergraduate videos on there. Um, I'm, I'm astonished at how many people actually use those videos. So you've heard of all this is the big rage at UW to flip classes. That's kind of how it is back at Georgia Tech. You know, we're flipping the classes, right? You make students watch videos at home, and then you come in and work problems, kind of the opposite of how a traditional college class is supposed to work. Well, we started flipping the classes at uh, Georgia Tech based on these videos. I made these videos and threw them online, not with the intention of flipping the classes. I actually thought, hey, you know, if I'm out of town, I'll just tell the students to, uh, to watch a video. And at Georgia Tech, we call that flipping off the class. So, uh, that, but, but uh, I'm surprised how many people actually, if nowadays, if, student, if you don't flip your classroom, some of your students will do it for you. So I'm always astonished by how many people actually re watch these videos. Um, I think between me and Cynthia Furse at Utah, like half the world that flips classrooms is you're using these uh, YouTube videos. So, um, that's a little background on my interests and what I do. Now, once we got into RFID, uh, we quickly realized that there were some really neat fundamental physics questions that always excite us as EMAG uh, profs and researchers. So uh, I, I think of like three main questions. And, and this talk is really mostly about two of them. Uh, one is, the information question. What is the minimum amount of power that I can exchange or that I can expend at a location and send data wirelessly, remotely, across the chasm of, uh, of free space or even if there are obstacles or what have you? And so uh, I, that, that's a fundamental question. And the more you know about radio communications, the more the answer will probably surprise you. Um, and that was the, the question that sort of got us into this field, since we, we knew a little bit of information theory and conventional telecommunications. <clears throat> and then the energy harvesting question. How, what's, how much power can we efficiently convert from RF to some usable form of DC or some other frequency power that we can then do communications and sensing and computation and that sort of thing? And then the third question, which I'm not going to touch on today, computation, what's the minimal amount of power required to perform computation? There are plenty of researchers that have been looking into that. But we try to keep abreast of that field just so that we understand what's going on technologically. So the first thing I'm going to start, I'm going to do a little out of order. I'm going to do minimum power RF energy harvesting. This is, what's the minimum amount of power that I can pull out of a radio wave and turn into a useful uh, amount of DC power, for example. And by far the cutting edge of, of this technology happens in the RFID world, in, in the commercial sense. Because they're making chips that are really testing the limits of what the mass scale CMOS type devices that you can easily make and cheaply make can do. So I have this, this graph. Here is uh, a collection of points that represent how sensitive 
an RFID tag. Now, unfortunately, in RFID, the word sensitivity means something different than it does in a lot of other spheres of electrical engineering. Sensitivity is, if I have a passive UHF RFID tag operating at 915 megahertz in the unlicensed band, the sensitivity is how much power do I need to get into the chip before it can energize itself and start doing the computation and communication it needs to to send a piece of data back to a reader, okay? So there's really like minimum energy required to do harvesting to get something useful out of. And I've got to hear a bunch of historical points from UHF RFID. Graft is a function of uh, year on the horizontal axis. And then on the vertical axis, I have logarithmically, mind you, the power in milliwatts that each chip in successive generations has, uh, has operated with. So you can see back in the dark ages at the end of the 1990s when we were still working probably with 500 micron pr processes and or, uh, you know, the, the, the really clunky type of chips. We were only getting about a little over 100 microwatts of power to get to energize a chip. And if you are operating under what I like to call Goldilocks conditions, um, that is, you're transmitting the maximum amount of power that you're allowed to into your antenna in the unlicensed band, that's one watt. You're getting the maximum gain from that antenna, that's six dBi, or a factor of four gain, just a little bit of focusing. And you have a beautiful free space channel and a tag floating in free space with nothing in between, no multipath, no blockages. And the polarization happens to be perfectly aligned and all this other stuff. And everything is matched. And you've done a great job. Then you can get five meters. More realistically, in, in everyday use, it was, you were lucky to get a meter or so at that point in time. Now, as we went on, the chips got better started to shrink down the CMOS logic circuits so they didn't even need as much power as they were using. We were able to incorporate Schottky diodes somewhere in the early 2000s. And you can see the, the curve accelerated downward. And I put this nice little trend line in the paper this comes from. I even have like a little equation. I call it uh, uh, Nicotine's Law because I ripped all the data points off of Pavel Nicotine's paper and it added a couple of my own. So, you know, everybody's got a law nowadays. So, we'll kind of call that Nicotine's Law in the talk. Now, you'll notice that the last data point I have on here dates from about 2013. It was the latest and greatest that came out of Impinge down the road. And that was 27 meters, a sensitivity of about eh, two people, five, six microwatts which is really impressive. And you notice that we're here at 2018, last I checked, and uh, I don't have any more data points. This is just a ca classic case of a lazy faculty member who's like recycling slides and just doesn't add anything. No, we haven't done any better than that because we've basically run into this limit where uh, we've done as well as we can do with the Schottky diode in CMOS type paradigm. We need some different ways of doing things before we um, uh, can advance any further. In fact, somewhere around 2010 is when the RFID tags become voltage limited instead of power limited. That means that even when this device dies now, it's actually converting enough power to drive the logic and the communications but it just can't make enough voltage to turn on transistors. It can't make the requisite few hundred millivolts to, to energize the CMOS logic. It's still converting about twice as much power as the chip actually uses at that point by our estimates. That's a rough estimate because nobody ever tells you what's going on inside, inside their chips. You have to kind of infer from the measurements that you make. Now to figure out why, what the limitation is and, and understand this, I have here a slide that has Six of about 100 different designs for charge pumps and energy harvesting circuits over the years that people have tried. They've had these half-wave rectifiers, single shunt rectennas, uh, multipliers, Cockroft Walton generators. There's a, a Dixon charge pump. 
There's all sorts of different varieties of this. My sole purpose of putting this up uh, is to, to note, what do all of these circuits have in common? There are two devices that you need to do rectification. What are the two devices that they all have in common? Capacitors, and what was the other one? Diodes, right. You need a capacitor to store power, and you need a diode to rectify. You need something nonlinear because you're changing frequencies. That's what nonlinear circuits do. If it was a linear circuit, you would just be adjusting the amplitude and the phase of, of the incoming AC or RF signal. So the problem with diodes is that you need to invest power to turn them on, right? They have this VI curve, and it's not the idealized first week of electronics class curve where it's zero, and then it goes up at zero uh, volts and, and turns into a perfect uh, short circuit. Instead, there's this graceful VI curve. And the amount of curviness at zero bias down at the voltage and current equals zero point is what limits the efficiency of that device for energy harvesting. So if you look, I could probably give a lecture entirely based on this graph. This was put together by my former PhD student, Chris Valenta. Uh, he tells me he, he spent 120 hours putting this uh, graph together. And I'm not, which sort, which, I'm not sure which is scarier, whether it really was 120 hours or that he actually counted the number of hours that he took to collect the data. Um, if you knew Chris, you wouldn't be surprised that he had done that. So uh, what we have here is input power and efficiency on the vertical axis. Input power is in the dBm scale. That's decibel milliwatts, 10 log base 10 milliwatts. And on the vertical axis, it's efficiency, percentage of efficiency. How much RF did you efficiently convert to DC? And the different color codings represent frequency regimes. So we have blue circles, that's 900 megahertz, 2.4, 5.8 gigahertz, and then usually like 10 gigahertz or above is the little uh, magenta star. And you'll notice that almost all of the frequency, independent of frequency, we have the same problem. Efficiency is really high when you've got a high power level, and then it just sort of falls off the table once you get down to the 10 to 100 milliwatts. And that's because energy harvesting always fails when you need it the most, right? You, you, you've got to invest to get something out of it using these circuits. And sure enough, it doesn't matter what frequency you want. The turn on voltage is still the same no matter what the frequency is of a diode for the most part. You can see that when you get up into higher frequencies, you've got other forms of loss, just the circuitry and the feed networks and everything just become so much lossy. So those reported values, you can see you're starting to shift inward and downward. They're becoming lossier at higher levels. You're getting some shunt capacitance and uh, issues across the junction at some of those frequencies. And you'll see that in the 915 megahertz, most of those points are down here because they come out of the RFID world where people are trying to work at low power levels to figure out how to energy harvest. Whereas you'll see more green dots and red dots up here at the higher power levels. That's the, the favorite band of wireless power transfer. The, you know, let's blast a bunch of power, a kilowatt from one mountaintop to another to see if we can remotely power something interesting. That's a different community. But they're all governed by the same physics. So it was, I think that was really one of my favorite things about this plot is that Chris plotted both communities' worth of data and kind of showed this beautiful continuum that exists between them. We can get those points to work up at close to 90% efficiency, actually, when, when you design it for a high-powered application. Now, so my goal in, put, in presenting this is to give you the backdrop of where we're at, and maybe in the next few slides give you an idea of where we're going and what will be possible in the future. So for example, we did a, a study, a paper study on, well, what if you used a different technique altogether? What if you used uh, what we call an RF thermoelectric generator to convert power? And did a theoretical study on what is the ultimate thermodynamic limit of energy harvesting? Like say I had a circuit that converted incident power to heat, then I'd use some sort of Carnot engine to convert the heat to DC. 
and I'll show you the, the graph on the next paper or on the next slide about what that ultimate efficiency looks like. But at first it seems like, well, that, that, that doesn't seem like a very useful thing to do. All of you good electrical engineers have been taught from the beginning of your curriculum that once you have power in electrical form, the worst thing you can possibly do is change it to mechanical if the end use is gonna be electrical or changing it to chemical or thermal because you invoke all these inefficiencies. However, we already saw that in the previous slide, we are interested in technologies that are already operating very inefficiently. And so some of these what almost looks like Rupe Goldberg contraptions for converting RF ener energy actually start to look pretty efficient. And they have the added benefit of uh, allowing you to transduce the voltage as well, not just putting out a voltage that's kind of on the same order of magnitude as the wiggle on your antenna, but rather stepped up in voltage, which is the real limitation in a lot of logic circuits. So this RFTG that I have outlined here, we have at the top path would be two RF connections capacitively or inductively coupled to a resistor that then heats up and then you pull the heat off with an, uh, down to an ambient temperature heat sink there through some thermoelectric elements and turn that into a D DC current source, basically. And thermoelectrics are just awful, awful in terms of efficiency. But they're not as awful as Schottky diodes at low power levels. If you make this device smaller and smaller, we did this little paper study that showed you could actually outdo uh, Schottky diodes. And in fact, I'm gonna plot on the next graph, here over here are all the 915 megahertz points from Chris Valenta's big graph, the ones that correspond to RFID. Here is sort of the idealized theoretical study for the RFTG, uh, thermoelectric generator. And then this green curve all the way down here is the theoretical limit for a CW harvester based on about 30 megahertz of bandwidth around 915 megahertz um, based on that thermodynamic analysis. And so you can see on the horizontal axis, this is DBM scale. We are orders of magnitude away from the efficiency limits of, of being able to convert power. Now there are some tricks to this, right? So for example, I would be remiss not to tell you that if this efficiency gets about past 15 to 20% for the RFTG curve, the device melts itself. You have to operate at too high of a temperature to convert power. But it turns out that before you get there, you're actually putting out a lot, of, a lot more DC voltage than these guys put out over here. And this isn't even the only way to do it. There are a lot of methods for transducing power from RF to mechanical, acoustic, uh, um, chemical, et cetera, different forms of energy, and then converting back that have the same sort of better than Schottky diode performance down at the low power levels. So we see that the power, we're still really, really far away from the theoretical limits of energy conversion. And even this theoretical limit isn't the worst you can, the, you, the best you can do. This is for uh, considering a CW waveform. If you add bandwidth and you're allowed to shape the, the transmission and add some peaks and valleys, it turns out you can concentrate the power in in uh, time and effectively push this curve arbitrarily downward. So there really is, even this is kind of a mirage. You can do even better than that. Uh, yes, Professor Smith. So the green curve, is, is that literally assuming that the heat goes into a Carnot engine? Is that where that's, that's exactly right. So, so the, the assumption just to, in a nutshell is basically if you're heating up a resistor, eventually the resistor gets hot and will black body radiate out the antenna However, the hotter the resistor gets, the more efficient the Carnot conversion. And so there's an equilibrium point where you maximize the power. That's where that green curve comes from. So I don't expect a thermal engine to operate down there in that, that regime. But it does show that the theoretical limits are really very far away from what we're achieving. And the problem is with RFID is that it's a heavily commoditized industry, right? We are making these 
tags with little chips on them. They gotta cost a couple of pennies. And so you have to use the most standard rock bottom devices that are available at the foundry to get them to work. If you're not limited by that, there's all sorts of crazy things you could get into. Things like tunnel diodes or these metal insulation metal uh, diodes. Um, I have a colleague that's looking into spin, spin diodes, which operate at very, very low currents, um, or very, very low voltages, I should say. And so it's, it's kind of a fun thing to game. At this point, we step back and say, well, okay, well, what is all this good for? What can we do? So we have a game that we play in our laboratory. It's called, what can we passivize? So you pick something. I, I, you guys can, I'll show you an example of this, but you can just pick anything you want. Next time you're on an airplane, just think about the airplane. Or, uh, yeah, if you're in an office, or if you're in your home, it's like, what can you passivize? And so here's an example of this game that we played with a car. You may ask yourself, is this Professor Durgan's car? The answer is no, of course not. I drive a pickup truck uh, with a bunch of car seats in the back and about a million Cheerios on the floorboard. This is much more akin to what our students are driving these days. So, um, so just go through, and I, I don't mean to belabor the point, but think of all the sensors you could either replace or introduce to a car if you didn't have to worry about the wires. If you just have a very small, low energy source that was energizing the field around the car and pulling data back, almost like a wireless equivalent of the CAN bus uh, that's in a car nowadays. First of all, you'd get rid of about 40 or 50 pounds of wiring, a tremendous amount of labor to put that into a vehicle, and you would be able to just add so much more capability uh, in, in sensing. So everything from could you sense headlight failure? So you don't have to drive around like I do for three months until somebody says, until the other one goes out and you realize, oh yeah, now my headlights are failing. Corrosivity sensing, a paint job almanac, whatever you wanted to put on there, you could do it. So, key points for that part of the talk. Uh, conventional chip making has stalled RF energy harvesting progress. Progress. We've been stuck at the same spot for about five years, but there's a lot farther that you can go. There are a lot of unconventional approaches. Intermediate forms of energy are very promising, and there are lots of cool applications. And not even just replacing existing sensors, but if you can imagine some of the things you can do with wireless sensors, that will enable a lot of other things that we probably don't even know about yet. We haven't dreamed up yet. So now I'm gonna shift gears and talk a little bit more of the information exchange for uh, wireless devices. What's the minimum amount of power that we can expend at a point and get information from that point to somewhere else? And again, RFID provides a really neat blueprint for doing some of this at extremely low power levels. So, how does an RFID exchange information? Well, the trick is it doesn't actually transmit. It does something called load modulation. You've got a tag over here with an antenna, and in the con for passive or semi-passive systems, that device is not transmitting anything. It just has an antenna and a load connected to it. An antenna, by virtue of the fact that it is a piece of metal, has a radar cross-section, just like any other piece of metal, or anything for that matter. The size of that radar cross-section depends on what you electrically connect to the antennas. So for example, if you put an open circuit, it'll have this big radar cross-section. If you put a matched circuit, matched load on the antenna, some of the power gets absorbed and the radar cross-section shrinks and the phase changes as well. And so this presents kind of an interesting way to modulate information. You can click back and forth, black back and forth, on two different loads, like opens and shorts, or matched loads and open circuits. And what will reflect from this system is binary information. And the neat thing about this is that you can, uh, you don't, you, you're, the tag is not providing the power for communications. And that's why this is such a low power technique for exchanging information. I think when I came here eight years ago, we had all this retrodirective antenna stuff, and I, it was a very heavy antenna talk. I took all the antenna stuff out of the pro, uh, uh, presentation because I didn't want to duplicate anything. 
So I was going to concentrate only on non-antenna stuff, which for an EMAG professor is very hard to do. So uh, I'm going to tell you about another technique that we recently came up with. We call it the quantum tunneling tag. It's a fancy word for sticking a tunnel diode at the end of terminals of, a, of a, um, an antenna. Does everybody remember what the tunnel diode is? You probably learned this. The your first electronics class or your first solid state uh, materials class and then promptly forgot it and never used it again, right? This is a, t a diode that has what's called a broken band gap. You basically, one, the easiest way to make it is to simply overdope a PN junction. Make it a super P and a super N doped junction. And what will happen is that the band, ga the, the, uh, band gaps will be so far apart from one, one another that the electrons will literally be able to tunnel from one conductor into the valence and then up to the other conductor band. And it looks almost like an ohmic contact at that point. So it starts out like, an, like a resistor. And then as you add, volt, add voltage, a potential difference across that gap, the band gaps come back into alignment and it looks more like a tr uh, conventional diode. So then all of a sudden the VI curve takes a nose dive into region two here flattens out, and then it, then it looks like that conventional exponentially increasing diode curve. Now, the, the guy that invented this was, uh, his name was Leon Isaki. He invented this in the late 60s, and uh, he got the Nobel Prize for it because the first time you could, you could see the effects of quantum tunneling. And the problem is nobody has ever used this device for anything for the most part. There's no commercially successful applications. There are some niche detector circuits that you can build with it. It's actually very hard to, to uh, find a tunnel diode. My researcher Francesco Amato, uh, he finished his PhD on this topic and we were able to find a provider in Colorado, RF Metallics, that has since discontinued their tunnel diode uh, manufacturing. And now he's got some source in Russia for giving him tunnel diodes. They, when, they used to cost us $50 a component whenever we had, wanted to put a diode. All it is is an overdoped PN junction. So that goes to show you that what, what investing money into a process can do, if something is just a little bit out of the ordinary of what you're doing, it just makes the components cost so much. So what does tunneling, tunnel diodes connected to antennas, what does that buy you? Well, the neatest thing about the tunnel diode is this high, what we would call high responsive area where the VI curve is taking sort of a boomerang. This all occurs at very low voltages, less than 100 uh, millivolts. So if you hook this up to an antenna and you don't bias it, it looks kind of something like a matched circuit, just absorbs the power. If you bias it in region two, just a little bit to the right of region one, with only tens of millivolts, all of a sudden you have a negative resistor on the terminals of your antenna. So if you think about it, if you treat an antenna kind of like a transmission line, think of your reflection coefficient formula. It's load minus feed line impedance divided by load plus in feed line impedance. The not denominator is always bigger than the numerator for a conventional circuit. But for one of these devices, because you have a negative RF resistance, the, the slope actually makes the denominator smaller. You basically have a reflection amplifier at that point. So you will reflect more energy than is actually incident on the device. We're not breaking any laws of physics here. Really what we're doing is just what any amplifier is doing. We're priming it with DC power and that DC power is being converted to RF energy. The nice thing about that is that it can happen at incident levels of power that are very difficult to generate um, if you had to do all this locally. So if you think about how a, a local uh, transmitter operates, You've got an oscillator, a disciplined oscillator, because you want to keep be on the good side of the FCC. And that actually takes a significant amount of power overhead. And then that feeds some sort of transmit amplifier that pumps power into your antenna. You can play games with your transmit amplifier and get that lower and lower power by just kind of biasing it smaller and smaller. However, you get to a point where now the frequency synthesis is taking all of your power 
from your device, and you can't go, go beyond that. There's a, a plateau that you can't go beyond. In a system like this with tunnel diodes, you can actually use the transmitter, the reader, as your disciplining oscillator, and then reflect that power from the tunnel diode. So here's an example that my student Francesco built. Yeah, I can't see the devices very well. There's the $50 tunnel diode. Uh, he won't even let me bring him in for show and tell. And then a bias T, there's a, a, a bias line coming out of there, there. And the SMA, of course, connects to an antenna to test the device. And here's something he scattered off of our roof, a little digital sequence. I think it's the ASCII uh, code for Georgia Tech GT. And uh, he was able to get this across our, our rooftop into our 5.8 gigahertz RFID receiver. Now, we said, OK, let's, let's see how well we can do this. So we went. <clears throat> luckily, Georgia Tech is in the middle of downtown Atlanta, midtown, actually. And our E building, we have access to the rooftop. Uh, I, partly, the, the, the justification for putting me out there is that uh, I do RF experiments, and then I can get out on the roof. The elevator doesn't even go up, up to my level on Van Leer. So I think they just want to like, get me away from people so that uh, I don't scare off the students. And so we get up onto the roof there, and we have all these skyscrapers over here in downtown Atlanta. And it just so happens our ECE accountant has a nice condo within line of sight at this building called Viewpoint that we were able to get out onto our balcony. And we were able to scatter a signal about 1,200 meters is using an RFID link, one over R to the fourth type link budget, from Van Leer to Viewpoint and back. Now, we were using some directional antennas. However, we were transmitting less than 20 dBm using a little antenna that was directional, a, another small directional antenna at the, uh, at the reflector tag, and then a collector that was steered in that direction as well. And the neat thing about this is that circuit that I showed you on the pre previous diagram was only drawing about 23 microwatts. Now, that, that's just the RF portion. So if you wanted to drive that with a little low-powered microcontroller, you would use a little bit more power. But 23 microwatts is good. You could actually power 23 microwatts continuously with a AA battery for about five years to transmit continuously five years on a AA battery. Um, and so that shows you kind of how not only can you use things like backscatter to do short range communications, but you can really use it to lower the power levels and do extraordinary field of view type uh, communications over a kilometer free space. Or you could trade off and say, well, I, maybe I only want to cover 100 meters, but I want to do it in an office environment where I have to lose 15, 20 dB going through walls. Now you've got this field of view that can en envelop a decent sized building or your home or something like that and take telemetry from. <clears throat> now, this is a very radical new form of communication link. You've got this huge field of view, you're backscattering. Keep in mind that these tags are pretty dumb. They'll backscatter anything incident on them. You can do things like keyed exchanges where you know you transmit a certain key and it won't respond unless it sees your illuminating reader signal, signal present and it has a, sort of the magic password to unlock communications. But even still, there's other stuff in the environment that strikes these antennas and reflects. Now, some people might think that's an, a problem, but that's actually an opportunity, right? If there's a stronger signal that's reflecting information, then there should be ways to enhance that. And so in the last couple years, especially, um, <clears throat> I've seen a lot of work, especially emerging from the communications society in the field of ambient communications. The idea is you have so much power available to you, so many RF signals, can't we just piggyback signals on the, the uh, sides of those? In fact, we've had some great examples of that come out of UW here. Uh, Professor Reynolds, I like the Bluetooth scatterer where you had a backscatter device that could mimic a Bluetooth device. And I, you could actually take a reader and read the, as if it were a Bluetooth signal using what is effectively an ambient signal or a CW signal. 
And then, uh, Professor Smith, you have a, a paper that we really like to cite involving um, <clears throat> a, a differential measurement, which solves one of the big problems in this field. How do you hear these signals? Because backscatter signals are so much weaker than either the tone that you're, you're starting to generate them with or the ambient signals that you're receiving. So if I were a reader, I, I always make the analogy, you know, I'm trying to hear a whisper in the back of the room and somebody's yelling into my ear, usually a tone in RFID. Uh, if, it's, if it's one of these ambient backscatter systems, then it's somebody's conversation, which can be even more irritating, right? More difficult to discern information. So how do you do that? And so I, <clears throat> the, next, the last part of my talk, I think I got about, I'll keep it quick. I'll keep it quick, because I want some Q&A time here. I don't want to be the speaker that just drones on and on. So for the ambient problem, <clears throat> how do we code a signal that embeds a signal into an existing information signal that allows us to pull it out easily? And ideally, what we'd like to do is kind of stick it on the sidebands, so to speak. But this idea of modulating information onto a sideband of an existing signal that has information is really nonlinear and messy. However, if we did put it on the sidebands, that would allow us to filter out most of the interference before we did any software processing, which gets to the heart of the difficulty of doing an ambient backscatter system. Let's say I had a whole campus full of sensors and I had a couple collector spots and they were using FM radio signals in the nearby environment to transmit telemetry from these sensors to a collector point. Well, <clears throat> I, I would need to cancel out that FM signal and the reader that, that would do that, if I did that all in software, it would have to have simultaneously an enormous amount of sensitivity and also an enormous amount of dynamic range. Now, technically, your cell phones have to have a lot of dynamic range and a lot of sensitivity, but it's never asked to have the same thing at the same time. You have uh, automatic gain controls and variable attenuators that kick, can kick in and say, I need to listen to uh, a high-powered signal. I need to listen to a low-power signal. Well, here, our RF reader for this type of system has to lift this into a high power and a low power simultaneously. If you don't do both at the same time, you lose the information. And so now we have a coding problem. How do we code the signal in such a way that we can stick information onto an existing signal? The only thing we have is load modulation at our disposal. So we can't do anything fancy with pulse shaping and all this. All we can do is transfer between two states, load one, load two. It's going to look like abrupt transmissions modulated onto an RF carrier that already has information on it. So I'm going to walk you quickly through this process that we went through to kind of show you what, we, what it, I believe is like an original mathematical discovery. And maybe I'll give you some insight on how professors uh, you know, approach new problems and just luck into certain uh, ideas and things like that. I haven't really seen anything done like this in the signal processing world. And so uh, I, I wanted to bring it before you to see what you guys think. <clears throat> so if you, first of all, nobody ever scatters just raw ones and zeros. The reason is, if you go back to your undergraduate uh, communications class, for those of you who have gotten there yet, you know that if I'm backscattering ones and zeros straight up, I'm making basically a bunch of square wave pulses. Highs are ones, lows are zeros. And if I do that, the power spectral density of that signal is going to be a sync squared. You remember that from your signal processing classes, from your Fourier transform classes? I'm not sure what the curriculum. Where, what is the class that they would learn that here at UW? 235 or Oh, OK. So, <clears throat> yeah, George Jackson loved DSP, so they, they, we have this DSP first curriculum. Uh, and so like, we, we get this stuff like really early on, even before the circuits, which was, took a lot of getting used to for me. And so we had this, uh, if the pulse, if the proto pulse, so to speak, is a box, the Fourier transform is a sink, 
if I put a bunch of random information on uh, a signal that's constructed like that, the power spectral density turns into a sinc squared. This is a terrible waveform to backscatter information on because the peak energy is at zero hertz, which means when it's modulated onto a carrier with information, means the peak power level is going to be right where that carrier is or the information is to jam the signal. What we would like to do is push that information off to the side. So we use something called, <clears throat> it goes by a lot of different names, a line code, a recording code, a modulation code, a channel code, basically a way of mapping raw bits to a larger number of bits that shapes the frequency. And what we're really wanting to do is to put a null in the middle of uh, our box. So this type of encoding actually dates back to the 50s. It's like one of the oldest ways to send digital information. It's called Manchester encoding. You just put, take a transition and put it in the middle of the box. So now it looks kind of like a one is now a high low or a one zero, and your zero is basically a low high. This is, they don't call it this, but from an information theoretic point of view, this is exactly how an RFID tag is sending information if it's using FM0 modulation. And the reason is that this Fourier transform now has a null in there, in the middle, right where the carrier that you need to cancel exists. You can chunk that carrier out, decode with relatively good signal to noise ratio using it, once you hit once the signal hits an A to D converter. So putting a, a, a transition there is good. Now, <clears throat> we, we asked ourselves, OK, if I put more transitions, can I get a deeper null? And the answer is actually yes. In fact, I came up with a set of polynomial equations. So if I had like n transitions, where should I put those n transitions? to deepen the null, to get the deepest possible null. And so I'd have this set of, for example, if I had a, this is what we call a P5, or a perfect pulse 5, where do I put my five transitions to give the deepest possible null, to basically remove the order F to the 5 and below frequency content in the Fourier transform? And it turns out I could, I had this system of polynomial equations I analytically solved for these. I actually could, could come up with a solution all the way up to P5, perfect pulse 5. And this is what it looks like. It's a nice oscillatory square wave. And look at this, a nice flat frequency spectrum. Very unusual for abrupt transitions that you get this region of flatness and then a peak that jumps up in the air. I was so proud of myself. And, <clears throat> and then one of my former master students came into my office. And this only happens at Georgia Tech. His name was Cody Lamb. He was a great person to work with. Um, and he came into my office and he said, Professor Durgan, I'm really enjoying using Mathematica. He says, do you know any really hard math problems I can work on with Mathematica? So clearly, Cody is my kind of guy, right? Just spontaneously walks into my office, asks for a hard math problem. I mean, he's, he's working. He's got a kid and a family. But you know, this is what he wanted to do. So I said, I know. See if you can solve for higher order than P5, perfect pulses with ridiculously higher order. So a couple weeks go by, and he comes back to my office. And this is what he shows me. He's got analytic solutions for P11 and P15. Here's the P15 solution. This is where all the transitions are supposed to be. And OK, so here's the eureka moment. This gives you an insight into the mind of a scientist deep in concentration on a problem. I looked at that and said, oh, Cody, that's so cool. And I looked at it again. I was like, I feel like I'm looking at the edge of a pizza. I was thinking about food. I say, wait a second. And sure enough, it turns out that there is an arbitrarily easy way to geometrically generate these pulses. You take a circle, and you cut it up like you were cutting up a pizza. And then you project the transitions up to the time axis. And this is how you make an arbitrarily complicated perfect pulse. So if you see, look how deep that P15 is that he hand, calcu well, hand calculated with Wolfram Alpha or whatever. The sh sharp transition pulses aren't supposed to do that. You make sharp transitions, and yet, 
there's this region of very quiet, almost zero content. And so this gave us sort of the impetus. We said, well, this is kind of something you'd need for modulating on ambient carriers. Because even though it's highly nonlinear, if you made waveforms based on these pulses, it would put most of the energy on the very edge of the band of your existing signal, which means you can now hardware filter out that in interior component and then still use the Josh Smith trick or the you know, ambient signals and, and all the other tricks for uh, recovering that ambient backscatter signal. <clears throat> and so here I just have a couple just the off spitballing examples of how you would modulate a signal. You could take, say, the perfect pulse order six and then just flip it back and forth like a BPSK signal. Or you could do some sort of frequency shift keying. You could maybe take four different perfect pulses and concatenate them, sending 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, or 1, 0, for example. Or you could do some sort of pulse width modulation. All of these signals have this remarkable property of having extraordinarily deep DC nulls. And then once you get to their spectral peaks afterwards, they kind of look like a conventional up and down. Yeah, Professor Smith. Do you think of it as like a chirp spread spectrum? It's very much like a chirp spread spectrum. It, you can generate them very easily if, you, if you've ever done anything with the Chebyshev polynomial. You know, they kind of look like oscillatory ones. And if you size it right and then just threshold it, you get these pulses. So there's still a lot we don't know mathematically about what's going on here. We could even use some, we need some elegant proofs. Uh, I have like a sketch of a proof in a paper for why these have deep DC nulling properties. But they're fun to play around with. And just as an example, <clears throat> uh, we took a perfect pulse modulated ambient signal. This, that dotted line is the frequency capture of an FM waveform. It was actually the college radio station we have on Georgia Tech campus. And then we put an ambient modulation on there. And we showed that even at very high signal to interference ratios, uh, or I should say very low signal to interference ratios, we could still decode signals with like 10 to the minus 1 bit error rate, and uncoded, unoptimized. This was our first stab at it. And it worked actually better than simply using a binary offset carrier implementation where you just put a sine wave in binary and XOR it onto your, your data and try to transmit that way. So this, I hope <clears throat> this gives you at least a, a small idea of what we're working on and some of the really neat problems that we need people to work on still, some of the potential of this field of energy harvesting, low-powered communications, and some of the neat things that you can do. And uh, <clears throat> I, I also think for those perfect pulses, we're still looking at like a lot of really interesting things um, to do, like how do you sound a channel that you're transmitting continuous wireless power to. Because you, have this, you don't want to interrupt your power supply, but it, it's like even worse than the regular full duplex problem because your power levels are so high. You just reflect a perfect pulse and get a really good estimate of what your channel is doing, even though there's this screaming power tone right in the middle of it. So I think there's some other analog, analogs to full du duplex problems that the perfect pulse would help so solve. Uh, some low bit quantizers, what's the best way to represent a signal with a low, uh, with only a few bits of data? And we think mathematically this might have some ways to represent, uh, if you're most faithfully trying to reproduce the spectrum of a signal. And you may have some other ideas too. This is a kind of a, a new field for us, so we'd entertain any ideas and encourage you to work on anything that uh, you saw. We're not the possessive type here, at least not in my lab. So with that, I'm going to stop, and then you can ask any questions. Wow, I left a whole whopping five minutes for questions. That wasn't as much as I was planning, but <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Perfect understanding. You have the best students. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you for coming out. Oh, uh, Professor Rodell. Thank you. Uh, actually, I was just kind of curious. If you looked at this low bit quantizer, have you looked at some of this work from Robert E. at UT Austin? Uh, we've talked about it. I was down at uh, UT Austin a year or so ago, and he was trying to do one bit quantizers 
on the front end of millimeter wave receivers. <clears throat> and so that's as far as I got. I, I kind of understand what he's working on, and I think this might help. But actually, I'm just curious on these low-bit quantizers. Have you guys thought about interference at all? Is that, is what I think is, is that's, that's kind of the, the killer. I think there's ways around that. But yeah, yeah. I just think that's the grand challenge. And sometimes it may be a guy like Robert. He, maybe interfere is not so much. He's concerned about He's kind of looking at this more as like an information theory problem. Yes, yes. And that's a good way to start looking at it. But eventually, there's this reality of RF hardware and interference that kind of sinks the enterprise uh, often. And I, so I think, I think this type of signal processing and representation with these waveforms might be a way to span that gap. We're not sure. I, I haven't delved into the problem. I'd like to learn a little bit more about what you think about full duplex. I know you've worked in that field some. Um, <clears throat> it seems like this is well suited. Uh, I have some ideas, but I don't know enough about that area to, to make inroads yet. Good question. Good question. Yeah. Good question about thermal electric harvesting. Yes. Uh, what kind of investments do you think would be needed to make one of these devices? That's a great question. So first of all, when I did that paper study, I thought I tried to find like the most exotic, coolest thermoelectric uh, devices material that I could and do some projections based on that. You got to th get things down to the nanoscale, like tens or 20 nanometers of scale to really make inroads into that problem. But we can do that now. We know how to do that. I've since come to the conclusion that we should not be using exotic devices. Silicon is just about the best thermoelectric material that we can possibly imagine. Like the, the laboratory stuff that's really cool uh, and, and is difficult to reproduce is less than an order of magnitude better than doped silicon still, the good old reliable. So it turns out that the, the thermoelectric part of the RFTG is easy to build, in, from my opinion. It's, it's got an overbuilt circuits, right? But uh, the hard part is actually sequestering the heat. So in order to get a resistor that small, that you can capacitively couple into, uh, the, resist the capacitor that makes that coupling happens might be at least at the 915 megahertz, for example, at least an order of magnitude bigger than the actual device itself, which is probably a non-starter. You lose more waste heat through side channels than you do through the thermoelectric device. I personally think, and again, this is just spitballing, this really works better at high frequencies, millimeter waves and above, where you can couple power very easily across a capacitive junction that's tens of nanometers by tens of nanometers. And in doing so, I almost think that maybe, once you get the device that small, maybe you, can, you could imagine an entire heat logic architecture where the heat becomes the signal and maybe now you can get back to breaking Moore's law on silicon again, go another order of magnitude, and, and speed things up again. Because, because now the heat isn't the problem. You're letting the heat become your signal. So you need a heat transistor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Think of it, if you had one of those RFTGs and a little CMOS um, switch on the output, because the RFTG, and now your supply line is not a one volt DC, it's maybe a 10 millivolt millimeter wave source. You couple it into the RFTG, you s then that, that results in a very big DC voltage, relatively speaking, that can't drive a lot of current, which would interface nicely with the CMOS gate, which then can turn, turn on your next stage. So I, I think that's a really neat uh, paradigm to explore. And it, you could do it in silicon. It would work really well in silicon. Uh, yeah. Um, you showed the comparison for the perfect pulse with the ambient FM modulation. <coughs> mm -hmm. I was just curious if you happen to do a comparison with just normal like BPSK, but instead of doing the, the perfect pulse, just adding on like an error correction coding. Oh, yeah, yeah. <coughs> so we had this joke, my, my department, old department chair, Steve McLaughlin, 
we did a little RFID collaboration together once. And he looked at it, he says, it's like the 1950s all over again. You guys aren't doing any coding. You aren't doing any you know, forward error correction or something. There's a whole area to explore by incorporating those things. We did not do that, and that would tremendously improve things. But uh, <clears throat> it, it, was, it was more resource and time limited uh, for, for uh, not incorporating that into the existing design. I have a PhD student, Mike Varner, who's working on this. And uh, that's, he's the resource, basically. It's not even what he's supported on at the moment. So we kind of make fits and starts on the things with, that we want to work on. But that's a great point. That, that would be a phenomenal exploration for something like this. OK, you guys need to get to class, don't you? It's like uh, five minutes after, oh, 1131. So I won't get, <laughs> it's your class, right? <laughs> Thank you.